Hi everybody, welcome to Safe Diving. In this video, I'm going to talk about dry suit undersuits, the more important half of your dry suit combination. You see, your dry suit is mainly there just to keep you dry. Uh, they aren't actually there to keep you warm at all, really. That is what your undersuit is for. All your dry suit is really there for is to trap a layer of air inside and keep the water outside. But your undersuit is made to maintain a constant layer of insulating gas all over your body and a good undersuit will resist compression from ambient pressure because of the material and the construction of the suit itself. Now, the best undersuit will actually wick moisture away from your body so efficiently that you won't even notice that you've sprung a leak at some points. So you can't just wear your sweatpants because, you know, they keep you warm on a chilly Sunday afternoon because they won't actually resist that compression and when they get wet, you get cold. A proper dry suit undersuit will prevent cold spots from gear pressing into you in certain places and allow air to flow properly around your entire suit so you have even insulation. I've been on some dives where my cuff seal has literally leaked um, but I had absolutely zero idea of that because my undersuit kept that cold water away from me so well and it still worked to keep me warm and dry even when it was wet. So if you're thinking about diving into colder waters and investing in a dry suit, then you need to know a little bit about undersuits too. Let's take a closer look. The first layer that you should wear against your skin should be a base layer. A base layer is a very thin, skin-tight suit that is there purely to keep you dry. They're not essential, but they do make a huge difference to how warm and comfortable you are. Base layers might not trap very much air insulation around you, but what they do is wick away any moisture away from your skin as quickly as possible, so your skin stays dry. By keeping small leaks and sweat off of your skin, it will help to keep you feeling warm, and if you're diving a lot, it'll keep you cleaner too. When you're inside that dry suit, your sweat has literally nowhere to go really. So you're in this sweaty, humid environment, if you're doing a lot of work, that can lead to infections, uh, but a good base layer will actually help to keep you staying fresher for longer. Now, they're not an excuse not to wash or anything, but you, you still have to wash yourself and your undersuit, obviously. But if you're doing a, a long expedition, you're away for days and weeks and you're wearing this again and again without washing it, uh, life's a bit nicer. You can also find thermal base layers that kind of blur the lines between a really kind of thin base layer that just keeps you dry and uh, an undersuit that actually has some thermal properties. Now, they're made to be worn in much colder waters to be layered up underneath an undersuit so you have even more insulation. But if you're diving in warmish waters in a neoprene dry suit, then you probably won't need much more than one of these. And if you have a built-in undersuit inside of your dry suit, like the waterproof, the D1, then a thermal base layer will just be perfect for you. Staying warm underwater is really a matter of layers. The more layers you have that work together, the better and warmer you'll be. So that's your first layer, your base layer. What about your, you know, actual undersuit? When you get to your actual undersuit, you can often get the choice of a single piece or a two piece suit. So a single piece undersuit is pretty much just a big onesie that covers you from head to toe or more realistically neck to ankle. It's, yeah, that's probably a better way of describing it. Um, so the benefit is that no matter what you do in the water, if you're moving your arms around, doing shutdown drills, whatever you want, you're always covered. The downside is, is that if your dry suit uh, undersuit doesn't fit you quite right or it doesn't have a, a kind of a great cut, especially around the shoulders, it can limit your range of movement so you can't move your arms to reach your valves or whatever. Uh, 
This is one reason why I love Santi undersuits because they have like 16 different core sizes and they literally have like four different larges. They've got large short, large long, large long long, um, seriously LLL is the size, that's actually my size on my dry suit uh, and of course they just have the standard large. So they'll find a suit and a size that fits you perfectly so you can reach behind you and have that full range of motion in your shoulders. Two-part undersuits are separate tops and bottoms so they eliminate that restrictive problem. Um, you have that kind of overlap so you can move around and each part is usually made to be quite a bit longer uh, so that you have plenty of overlapping material just around your midsection. The last thing that you want is to, you know, sort of reach up and adjust your mask and it exposes some bare skin and you get a chilly bit touching your um, your bare abdomen. They do give you a bit more flexibility as well, so you can wear a thicker top and then sort of something a bit thinner on the bottom or vice versa for whatever reason really. Um, you don't have to have that is your suit. Um, and they usually don't have any zippers, uh, which are a traditional kind of cold spot because you don't have nearly as much sort of insulation right along that line. But they can move around during a dive. Your one piece is pretty static. Once it's on, it's on. Uh, your pants can't really slip down or your top can't really ride up anywhere on a single piece. Um, it's not that often that it does on a two-part suit, but it can happen where, yeah, if you sort of reach up too much, then a little bit moves up. You do it again and it moves up and it kind of stays up. Choosing between a single piece and a two piece is really kind of personal choice. Uh, neither is particularly better than the other. Um, it's really just a personal choice. Um, but aren't, uh, undersuits aren't just uniform thickness material. Um, let's talk about body mapping. Fourth Element coined the term body mapping with their undersuits. Uh, undersuits will have thicker panels, or some undersuits will have thicker panels um, and kind of thinner panels at key areas around your body for added warmth and flexibility. More traditional suits will just be made from a single thickness material all over, uh, which isn't the most effective method because heat doesn't radiate out of your body uniformly and certain points uh, on your body are more important to keep warm. So and now we have body mapping. So thicker sections obviously trap more insulation around that key area, so they're good for high heat loss areas like your kidneys um, and uh, sort of areas like your chest and uh, your upper thigh. They'll often have thicker panels to keep your body functioning properly. But for areas where you need to move around, like your inner elbow, behind your knees, underneath your arms, they're usually much thinner and more flexible. Around your uh, sort of left shoulder and the cuffs, you'll find mesh panels a lot of the time. These are for airflow. Apart from insulation, your undersuit is made to allow for easy airflow so you can move and uh, sort of migrate air inside of your dry suit to a dump valve and then purge it when you need to. So these sections will allow for easy gas movement right next to the valves so that, that air can flow easily. But whilst we're talking about keeping core body parts warm, uh, what about heated undersuits? Some fancy undersuits can have heated elements sewn into them, which on a really cold or a really long dive can sound amazing. But always remember that changing your body temperature will affect your decompression, so only use these externally heated undersuits when you properly understand their implications. Now, there are a few variations when it comes to heated undersuits. You can find some chemical vests, um, but these can be quite dangerous for scuba diving. Now, I've only ever heard stories of these. I've never really seen them, especially made for uh, sort of scuba diving. Um, but from what I understand, they're a bit like those little hand warmers where a chemical reaction kind of produces heat. Only once that reaction has started, there's no way to stop it. And when it's stopped, it's stopped, it doesn't sort of continue to go on. Now, I've heard tale of one diver actually, um, or sorry, one heated vest actually burning a diver because they used nitrox to inflate their suit. The oxygen reacted with the chemicals badly, and um, yeah, bottom line, 
don't use chemically heated uh, sort of vests while scuba diving. Electrically heating coils um, are the much preferred methods. Uh, these will warm up key sections of your body and they're usually connected to a battery. So batteries can either be internal or external, uh, whether the battery is on the inside of your dry suit or on the outside. Internal batteries are usually much cheaper, um, but they're, they're inaccessible once you're actually in the water. So if something malfunctions or your dry suit leaks, water's going to get to that battery. You cannot get to that battery to, uh, to disconnect it until you literally unzip that dry suit, so do bear that in mind. They do have the benefit of being self-contained, so you don't have to worry about how to get the power inside of the suit without uh, sort of risking water ingress. However, they do require a wireless remote control that's on the outside of the suit to control the heat. Uh, so you either have a suit that you turn on at the beginning of the dive and that's it until it just runs out of juice or you switch it off. Um, at the end of the dive, you unzip yourself and disconnect it, uh, or you have a little remote control that goes through Bluetooth or whatever that might lose connection. External batteries are the most popular choice, uh, but of course they're usually the most expensive. Um, but really that's because they typically have a much larger capacity compared to internal batteries. You see internal batteries, because they have to be pretty much against your skin, they tend to have fairly small batteries um, so that they're not too in the way and they don't kind of dig in anywhere. If it's an external battery, it doesn't really matter how big it is, it fits on your belt, so they can have a much larger battery capacity. The heating coils themselves will often be the same, uh, it's just like a, a sort of a coated wire and, um, and yeah, it's fully flexible, you can kind of feel them, you can usually see them um, sort of woven into certain suits um, and you'll have a power cable that leads to your chest where you'll need a special inflation valve for your dry suit that also has an electrical cable that leads outside of the suit. You'll then have a waterproof connector, something like an EO battery, uh, uh, EO cable um, that will lead to your battery. <clears throat> your battery will have an on off switch, you see there are a toggle switch or maybe a piezoelectric switch and if all else fails and um, it's sort of going mental inside, you're getting way too hot, you can just disconnect it and um, it switches off. External batteries are much safer because you can literally disconnect the power if it starts to overheat and you have definitive control of where and uh, sort of when it's turned on and you can literally tell when it's switched on whereas sometimes you can just look at the, uh, the, sort of the Bluetooth remote and don't really know whether it's switched on or not. But if heated undersuits are a bit daunting, a bit expensive, um, what sort of thicknesses can you expect to find in an undersuit? Undersuits come in a whole range of different thicknesses for different needs. Thicker undersuits obviously trap more insulation and keep you warmer. So you'll find kind of thinner undersuits, which are like summer undersuits. Um, they'll be sort of a much thinner material where you don't want anything quite so bulky. And then you'll find thicker winter suits. Manufacturers are never really that specific though uh, when it comes to warmth uh, because there's no easy metric to measure the warmth of a particular suit to compare them numerically and then you're made to sort of layer them up with different undersuits so manufacturers don't tend to promise that much particular warmth ratings because it's really hard and it's going to be different for different people. Now, the thickness that you do need depends on a lot of different factors, including the water temperature, the dive time, and even the dry suit that you're diving. One big difference between membrane and neoprene dry suits is the insulation. So a membrane dry suit is really, remember, just a very thin shell with no warmth to it. Neoprene is much thicker, so they have their own thermal warmth. So depending on which dry suit you're diving, you may want to choose a different undersuit. Neoprene dry suits can often get away with a much thinner undersuit and sometimes no undersuit at all. During the summertime in my neoprene dry suit, I'd only wear a decent base layer or at most a thermal base layer, something between a base layer and an undersuit as far as thickness. 
in my membrane dry suit for the same dive, I want something a lot more substantial just to stay warm. It's just something that you kind of need to work out for yourself, I'm afraid. I, I can't really say buy this undersuit and you will be fine. Um, you just kind of have to try it out and log your dives properly include the water temperature and your comfort level and then you work out okay maybe i need to wear sort of a little bit more the next time the thickness of your suit obviously affects your buoyancy too if you have a big old uggy bear or a weasel undersuit uh, like you're wearing a sleeping bag it's going to trap a lot of air that will make you much more buoyant so you're going to need a whole lot more lead to get down the first time a buddy of mine wore a waterproof D1 dry suit with that built-in undersuit, he was surprised at just how buoyant he was with that constant layer of insulation. The thicker you go, the more lead you are likely to need and the greater change in your buoyancy as your depth changes. So bear that in mind when you're thinking about going for that really thick undersuit. You now have the, uh, the added complication of new materials whipped up in science labs. It's not just wool and cotton now. Those kind of natural fibers don't always do so well when they're wet. Um, it used to be that you just have a thick quilted undersuit and then the numbers of, um, sort of the layers of material in that undersuit determines just how warm it was. But now we have modern hollow fiber insulation, mesh tech, which is a cool kind of two layer material that's separated by a hollow mesh that doesn't compress. You've got a whole bunch of these tiny little hairs between the layers that kind of push them apart um, to maintain that air gap. And now we're even having uh, sort of argon infused materials and they're experimenting with all sorts of clever stuff. So in our modern world with space age fabrics, thicker doesn't necessarily mean warmer. Personally, I've worn waterproof mesh tech uh, for a few minutes and I was noticeably warmer, um, but it's a pretty thin material in itself. So it's not so easy to work out which undersuit is the warmest anymore. Either way, expect to see lots of polyester with kind of fleecy linings on the inside and kind of a robust outside that kind of resists rubbing and some are actually hydrophobic, so they push water away. Um, but that's the kind of the main material of the suit. What about the teeny tiny little features that make an undersuit great? There are a bunch of small features on undersuits worth looking for. The first one is thumb loops around the cuffs. When you're donning your dry suit, your sleeve can ride up, which is really awkward. So a good undersuit will have thumb loops to keep the sleeve in place and uh, sort of then you can sort of unhook that loop so that you can still have a cuff seal and stop the water from going up. Or if you leave it in place, if you're diving a dry glove system, and that allows you to equalize your gloves, allow some airflow to get into your dry gloves. The same goes for the bottom of your legs. You should find some kind of stirrup um, that helps keeps the bottom of your legging from riding up. The bottom section of the legs are usually much thinner as well because you'll layer up your socks over the top of them and you don't want your ankles to get too bulky and restricted um, so you can still do some proper thinning. Pockets. If you can find an undersuit with pockets, then you are definitely onto a winner. As any girl will tell you, living without pockets can really be a pain in the backside. So if you can find an undersuit with pockets, they are so useful. You don't tend to put that much inside them, especially during the dive, but afterwards, after the dive, when you don't want to take your undersuit off because it's nice and warm, um, they're really useful for pockets and just bits and bobs. Some undersuits will have dedicated spots for a P-valve, uh, so you can run the hose through them. Either way, you can just cut a small hole wherever you want on the dry suit, uh, sorry, in your undersuit, but some have pre-prepared spaces um, for that hose, or they also have one for heating cables as well. Some undersuits also have special butt panels uh, made to keep your butt dry uh, if you sit down on something wet whilst you're kitting up. So that's quite nice to keep your bum dry. Um, it's, it's the little things that count, isn't it? Uh, and men's suits, uh, if they have a zipper down the front, if it's a onesie, um, then the front will usually have a double zipper so you can undo from the bottom to go to the bathroom without taking the whole suit off. Women's undersuits, on top of being a better shape and a cut for your body shape, um, they can also have one of those flaps on the uh, at the back I think they're called a flapjack um, just so that you can unzip that and go to the loo without taking your nice warm undersuit off completely and sitting there awkwardly 
But your undersuit doesn't stop at your wrists and your ankles. Let's talk about gloves and socks. Most undersuits don't have built-in socks, so you have to buy them separately. Uh, much like undersuits, socks will come in a range of different thicknesses, and some undersuits will actually have a matching sock in that kind of range. But you don't need to match everything uh, sort of perfectly. Personally, I quite prefer a thinner sock because I have a really warm undersuit, and I don't really need a thick sock to uh, sort of keep my feet warm and. Um, I just find that a, a sort of a thin sock is just a bit more comfortable, but that's my personal preference. Um, socks can range from anything from really thin merino socks uh, that feel just like a good pair of cotton socks. They're really, really thin. Um, and then you can get everything up to really thick kind of classic socks. Again, it's more like a, um, a sleeping bag on your foot. It really depends on how cold your feet get on dives and how much space you have in your boots. Socks are usually pretty long as well, again, so you have plenty of overlap, and you normally wear these over the bottom of your undersuit. You can sort of swap it over, but screw it, I just tend to put it over the top. The same goes for dry gloves. Uh, you still need to wear a pair of gloves underneath the actual dry glove to keep your hands warm, but they don't need to be particularly thick. You can find a whole mixture of different artificial fibres and good old fashioned natural fibres. One of the best is Merino, again it's a warm natural wool and it's very very thin. Then you can find alpaca wool gloves which are also fantastic um, and um, even when they get wet you still stay pretty warm. Um, but dry gloves are just the best when they're thin, uh, it helps with the dexterity so you can actually feel and touch things. Um, and the gloves themselves are usually fairly short on the wrists so they don't get in the way of your cuff seal so if you're just looking at your um, your sort of glove drawer or bag or whatever you have to keep your winter gloves in uh, you want something fairly short uh, so yeah it, it's pretty important to get your undersuit right and, uh, and not let it be an afterthought too many people just think about their dry suit and then they just oh yeah I suppose I need an undersuit as well and they and they buy something cheap if you're ever cold on a dive then it usually means that you're just not wearing enough exposure protection dry suits themselves are great but they are only there to keep you dry they're not called warm warm suits, they're dry suits. But investing in a great undersuit is better for more than just your diving. If I don't have any plans to go out, uh, I'll actually save some money on my central heating and just wear my undersuit in the dead of winter. It's also nice to have a backup if your boiler ever decides to pack up too, uh, just throw your undersuit on. But what do you guys think? Do you dive in a thick quilted sort of retro style undersuit or are you more of a modern fabric diver? Let us know in the comments below. Thank you for watching and of course, safe diving.